Um, so we moved on to, we have to now finance these operations. Um, and uh, it takes a lot of finance because we're buying weapons as well, we're buying uniforms, and we're only going to get our money later. So nothing was financed for us. We were financing these things ourselves. So now we needed more money, so now we're, we're taxing drug dealers again. Um, but also there was associates of this guy in Spain that was going to have to get um, kidnapped so we could earn some money. He'd stolen a few million as well, maybe five or six million. And uh, he had a big house in Staffordshire, huge house. His He was divorced. His wife had a huge house, again, with a helicopter pad on it. Uh, in the guy's driveway was maybe two, three million pounds worth of cars, Lamborghinis and Ferraris, McLaren, Rolls Royces. I mean, these guys were, were coining in big time. Um, and so, yeah, we ended up kidnapping him and his whole household and his mates and... It was comical. Like, it was literally comical. It was ridiculous. Um, I, again, we went in as police officers. We got the idea, actually. I told you we worked on the set with Helen Mirren and Prime Suspect. So we were dressed as armed police. And in between in between shoots, um, some crowds had turned up trying to see from where we were fenced off what's going on. And we were walking uh, back to wardrobe, uh, about four of us with police uniforms on. And members of the public were like, what's going on there, officer? And we were like, oh, yeah, all right, all right, yeah. Move back, please, move back, please. As a, a, you know, And they all moved back. And so we kind of cottoned onto this idea that if you're dressed as a copper, people will obey you and they'll listen to you, you know? And so that, we, that was more crime that we got into, impersonating police officers. We managed to get some real police uniforms and police badges. And there was this other guy. Uh, who was connected with the German and connected with the guy in Spain. He'd stolen a lot of money, and so we did surveillance on his house. Um, there was a, a church graveyard that backed onto this guy's property, so we'd already stashed our uniforms and weapons there. Um, the night we went down to, to kidnap him, uh, the guy who was doing... Uh, how are we doing for timing? Yeah, we're right? good. We're at two hours right now. We'll, 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 we're going to finish with the German story, so just keep going with the yeah. German story. Yeah. So... Um, so what happened there was um, the guy who was doing surveillance for us, he couldn't get a phone signal where he was, so he had to leave his post. He had to come about half a mile away to phone us to say, it's on, they're all in there, and they're all coked up, um, so come in, you know. But what he, what he didn't see in the time he left, the guy's ex-wife turned up with his kids, mm. dropped the kids off because they were about to go to Monte Carlo. Um, and so we've gone into the house, um, and as we've gone in through the front door, I can see little kids' suitcases. I can hear some kids. Mm. So we've, I've just went like that and we've backed out. We went back several weeks later and uh, and he was there at that point. So we managed to hold the guy hostage. And he, and where it got comical is we're now holding his girlfriend hostage. We're now holding his two mates hostage. While all of this is going on, we're dressed as coppers and I've got a police badge around me. Um, the front gate buzzes and I can see on CCTV there's a like a decorator's van at the front door and he's like oh we've got the decorators coming in today because we're leaving and so I've had to go out I've had to take the earpiece out um, because I can't because my mates are chattering and I can't hear what the decorator's saying and I'm pretending to be a copper and I'm saying you can't work today sir I'm just going to do a PNC check on your car number plate and I'm pretending I'm doing that and I say okay on your way um, but while that's happening, the two cleaning ladies have climbed over the, the back mm-hmm. fence because we've locked that and they're now in um, the in the hallway and they're talking to my two mates who are pretending to be coppers telling them sorry ladies we've got a police operation going on here today but we had I had stockings underneath the, the police hat right mm. so as I'm coming back in now I've pulled the stocking down I've got the gun and I've barged in and these, these women are like oh what's going on here so it came on top so so they're now hostages we've got hostages all over the place oh god um, so in the end what we did is we just emptied his safe made him transfer money through his computer to the German. I gave the clean ladies a bung each. They got about 10 grand each, so they were happy. Um, and uh, and we got out of there, and nothing further came of it. It was never reported. I can talk about it today because it was never reported as a crime. But, but, then, but then you have a situation where you have to take some guys out to the woods. Well, we two, two more of those other guys had now been kidnapped, and um, they also owed a lot of money. Um, that was quite intense because those guys thought they were going to die. 
So we kidnapped them in broad daylight at their factory unit. Uh, we've taken them to the German in some factory. Don't uh, one of them crap himself as well, you five hour journey. Yeah, uh, yeah. unfortunately it was stinking in the back of the van. Um, I always say to people, it's a smell that I'd, I'd never uh, want to smell again. The smell of fear and urine and feces together. It's a horrible smell. Um, but one of them had crapped himself. They, these were just like regular Joes. They'd gotten over their heads and you know now they've got these guys that hold them off. They're, they're cable tied in the back of a van. They've got pillowcases over their head. Um, they've been taken to the German. Information's been extracted from them and the Germans had take them away and, and bury them. So we we took them to a field. If the information they've given turns out not to be accurate, he wanted them dead. So they were taken to a field with, with, with guns over them and um, and it was going to boil down to me whether or not that was going to happen or not. Um, and again, I was a different character in those days. Fortunately for them, the call came through, the information they'd given was correct and we let them go. But my life was really spiralling out of, out of control and uh, eventually the police caught up with me and I was thrown into prison for, for five years. And it was there that my life completely changed in the other direction, you know. And you've got a ton of prison stories. But what we're going to do is, I've sat here absolutely mesmerised, John. You've done an absolutely brilliant job. Um, all these stories are expanded on in this book. And if people want to get your book, it's available worldwide on Amazon and they can get it in the bookshops in this country as well. Yeah, um, I don't know where it's stocked, but then they can go in and order it. But yeah, it's on Amazon. And, I think uh, in the comments... Places. People are going to be like, you got to get John back on, man. These stories are just absolutely mind-blowing. Um, but before we absolutely conclude, if you just want to say a little bit about where you are at in life now and what you're about to go do, that, that would be great to balance all this other stuff out. Yeah. Well, you know, I talked to you about a change, and, 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 and a change, uh, my life is very, very different today. So um, there I am now serving five years in a Scottish prison. Proceeds of Crime Act have confiscated all my money, home, I get divorced, and I'm kind of reevaluating my life. And uh, I get pestered in this prison by a Nigerian prisoner to go to a, a Bible study, of all things. And I was an atheist. I didn't believe in God or anything like that. But after four months of being pestered, I agree to go because he tells me that there's cakes and coffees and biscuits available in this Bible study, right? So I think, great, because I knew one thing about Christians. When they pray, they close their eyes, right? And they had this little table with cake, and coffee, and biscuits. And I'm thinking, <laughs> when they get in their little holy huddles, <laughs> I'm going to fill my pockets, right? Um, but before I could steal anything, this pastor guy moved us to the other side of the room. And then these guys, they start singing these Christian songs. And I'm thinking, I just don't want to be here, you know? I mean, life is multiple life is bank robbers, drug dealers, this violent idiot. And they handed me this sheet, song sheet with these um, Christian lyrics on it. And... I'm not ashamed to tell you that in that moment when I look at these hardened criminals and I was reading the lyrics, I knew I was going to cry. Mm. Like, I hadn't cried since I was a little kid. You know, my dad really abandoned us in a bad way and, mm. and we ended up, I ended up being raised on the worst housing state in Europe, just outside Glasgow as a result. But um, I hadn't cried in years, but I didn't want them to see me crying, so I, I hid my face behind the song sheet. I cried, and the following week I went to see that pastor and said, what is all that about? He shared with me a message that changed my life. And in simple terms, without using too much Christianese language, he used language that I was familiar with. He talked about being a judge and a legal system in punishment. The way he shared it with me, Sean, he was like, have you ever thought about God? And I said, not really. I've always thought maybe there's something bigger. I wasn't one for thinking we all just came from monkeys. or I saw too much order. I knew when there's a painter, when you see a painting, there's a painter. You see a building, there's an architect. For me, I just saw too much order in life for it to be anything. But I didn't, I didn't put it with a God thing, right? But uh, the way he explained it to me, he said, John, you, you, you committed a crime. You went to court. You stood before a judge. The judge found you guilty, and you were sent to prison. I said, yeah, obviously. He said, well, look, as Christians, we believe that one day you're going to stand before God. You might have heard the term Judgment Day. I was like, yeah, it's a good movie, Judgment Day, isn't it? Terminate. He said, no, come on, be serious. I said, yeah. He said, well, one day you're going to stand before God on Judgment Day, and on that day you think you'll be guilty or innocent. I said, I don't know. Maybe God can see that, you know, I love my missus. I've done good things. You know, when I was on bail, I won all these awards 
from the police and uh, the fire department. I saved all these people from a burning building. And it was all over the newspaper. I'm, a, I'm like a hero, you know, because God, God can see that as well, right? And he said, did that work for you in court then? Like when, when you were getting done for kidnap and extortion and you said to the judge, but I've done some good things too. The judge go, all right, I'll just let you off. It don't work that way. You can't bribe the judge with your good works in the same way you can't bribe God with your good works. He said, but imagine when you were in court, right? You had a, a massive fine to pay or, or 10 years in jail, but you didn't have any money to pay your fine. But somebody else stands up in court and says, I'll pay his fine. They write a check, they pay you fine. The judge can legally let you go free because the fine's been paid, right? I said, yeah. He says, okay, so you've heard about Jesus dying on the cross. I said, yeah, of course, everyone's heard of that. Whether you believe it or not, it's up to you. He said, well, we believe that God sent Christ into the world. He lived a perfect life without sin. And when he went to the cross, it's like he wrote a check for your life. He took the punishment that you deserve for breaking God's laws. Um, and he wrote a check for your life. After three days, the check cleared. Christ rose from the dead. Everyone's familiar with that story. And he paid the price. But you've got to accept that free gift. And are you aware, are you aware of the legal implications in the heavenly realms? I was like, what do you, what, what do you mean? He said, legally, God can dismiss your case because Jesus has paid your fine. Now, I'd never heard it put in that way before, like simple, proper, simple terms. He says, and the Bible says there's two things you can do, repent and surrender your life to Christ. If you do that, you'll, you'll, you'll have heard that term born again. And of course, I, was, I ridiculed that. Oh, yeah, the happy, clappy lot. He says, no, no, you get a new heart with new desires. You become like a new creation. I didn't really believe it at the time, but I listened, and it made me think, and I spent the next week really thinking about this whole God thing and whether it's real and whether it's not and standing before God. Um, the long and short of it is about a week later, I prayed for the first time in my life. I became a Christian in that prison. And my life really did change, mate. It really did. Like thoughts of crime began to go. I began to have more empathy for people that I hated, that I had no time for. It changed. I was released from prison in 2007. Um, in 2008, I went on to what they call the mission field. And I began to get invited to some of the hardest prisons on the planet to share my story. It was full-time voluntary. So I wasn't entitled to dole. I wasn't entitled to government help because I wasn't making myself available for work. And it wasn't paid. For the last 12 years, I've not had a job or an income. Um, I've relied on people making a donation, wow. people inviting me, paying for flights, that kind of thing, you know. Mm. So no job, no income for 12 years. Yeah, I have a book. You've got a book too, Sean. People don't make much from books. Ah, yeah. You took the words right out of my mouth, as, as Meatloaf said, right? Mm -hmm. So um, you don't make much money from books. So it's not an income stream, but it, what it does is give me an opportunity to get invited to places. So for the last 12 years, I've been invited to some of the toughest prisons on the planet, uh, prisons in Maori prisons in Manawatu in New Zealand, all the way to prisons in Guatemala. I've uh, been into some of the most notorious prisons. You might have seen the Ross Kemp program where he went into Polesmore Prison. You spoke there. I spoke to 3,000 men in there. I've spoken there several times. You told me earlier on yeah. that you went you went in there. Um, there's a thing with the numbers gang whereby they take women, but they're actually men, but they don't think it's... They, they call them a wifey. So a wifey. Uh, the most notorious numbers gangs in Polesmore are the 26s. Then you have the 27s and the 20, 28s. Uh, what will happen if you're not in a gang is you'll be forced into a gang um, and they will take a wifey. So they'll make a, a man, they'll subject him to, to doing the cleaning, the washing and the cooking. They'll also force him to have sex. Uh, they don't consider that a homosexual act because they see him as a woman. And um, a lot of them, uh, I'll send you some of the photographs from, from that day, but you'll see a lot of the, the guys hanging out the cell windows. They have their front teeth here missing. They're all missing and the guy who was our guide, he was a former prisoner there, and he also had his teeth missing. And I said, you know, why do all these guys have their teeth missing? And he said, well, really? So they, they can't chomp down when they're forced to give oral sex to another man, you see. So it, it, it's, it's pretty, pretty awful. And you see a lot of them with their, with their front teeth smashed in or missing, so they, they knock them out so they can't, they can't bite. Um, but I, I did confront a guy in there, and I said, so so you, you, you make another man your wife in prison? Yeah, but he's only a prison wife. I said, what do you mean a prison wife? It's only a wife in prison. Outside, I have a, a woman wife. I'm like, so are you, are you gay? Are you homosexual? No. So they wouldn't accept the fact that 
that they're committing a homosexual act. They just see it as it's a woman and they subject them to that. Um, yeah, so it's it's a mean place, Polesmore Prison. That's called gay for this um, day in America. Oh, well, I've never heard of that expression before, but yeah, they, they do that. So uh, it never appealed to me very much, but uh, it seems to appeal to them. But it's a, it's a, it's a harsh, harsh prison. And you're about to go back out there. Uh, I'm leaving uh, in a few days, actually. Um, I'm heading not to Cape Town this time or Joburg. I've spoken in, in prisons in Johannesburg as well to uh, get about two and a half, three thousand men they brought out into the football field. Um, I've been into prisons where, I guess one of the worst ones was in Romania, right? So we got escorted to this classroom to speak to these Romanian prisoners. We got escorted by what looked like a SWAT team. Twelve um, prison officers dressed like SWAT in full riot gear. With ba They had to hide their faces in case they get recognized on the out. They march us in there with weapons, and they march us in there to this part of the prison they open the classroom door, they put us in there, and they say, we'll be back for you in two hours. And they leave. <laughs> <laughs> so it's quite interesting. Uh, and, and these guys uh, and, and some of the conditions that they're living in are, are just awful, like awful, awful conditions. I've been in prisons in India that you wouldn't put your worst enemy in. In Guatemala, where the guards won't even go into the prisons. Um, but, you know, I've got to say, I know it sounds a bit weird, but prisons my favorite place to go these days because it was in prison where I felt that I was finally set free. And so for me, if I really believe, I don't want to be a hypocrite. If I believe that Christianity is true, if I believe that I was set free and my life changed so much, then I think I'd be a bit of a hypocrite if I didn't then take that message back to try and pass it on to others. I don't want to force religion down people's throat. Just share it in a normal way and say, think about these things because my life was changed from night to day um, by this message. If you want to find out more, go see a church. I think it's really moving that you went from this scary lifestyle. I mean, people watching this, good grief, out of all the people I've interviewed, they're probably thinking, back in the day, they would not want to have been a target of you and your team. That's one of the scariest things that could possibly ever happen to someone from just all the people I've interviewed and speaking to you today. Let's go from there to... Um, going all over the world to the most depraved, run-down prisons to inspire people to get on the right path. Man, that is, that is so moving to me. And the fact that you're not even getting paid to do it, you're relying on people just, you know, paying for your travel expenses and, and, and sending you donations. Do you have a page that we can put below this video so people can donate to you yeah there's uh well i guess you, you can you know i'm not here to look for donations if if someone feels moved and they want to make a donation yeah look i'll, I'll snatch your hand off I, I really need it you know i'm going to south africa in a few days the church that invited us we're not in a position to pay i've raised the money through mm. different friends that have donated and given to that um the church we're going to pay but they also run an orphanage right and um, and what, what will happen is I'll get invited to places and they might raise a collection and they'll give me something. So I, I'll have a small gift to come back with. In, in, a, in a Western country or a wealthy country, in other places in Africa and, and, and in India, that's just not going to happen. So we, we'll raise all of the funds. But usually, in, you know, like in this country, I get invited somewhere. They'll make a donation. It covers my expenses. And maybe I, I get 100 quid as well, you know, which is great because that will help me get to the next place. Um, I speak in ones with prison on a regular basis. They ask me for 50 copies of my book. You know, you don't get your books for free. You know, my books cost me four quid each from my publisher. That's 200 quid. So I take them 50 copies of the book and then I get an email from the pastor saying, the chaplain there, can you bring some more? Your books are proving so popular, the prisoners are selling them on the black market mm -hmm. in the prison, right? But mm -hmm. I've got to raise the funds. So, but here, but then I can put out an appeal and say, can anyone help me? Or if I, I'm at a speaking engagement, I'll say, look, if you buy the book for a tenner, it costs me four quid. If you buy it for a tenner, I can give two away in, to a prison. So people will go, oh, well, I'll buy two copies. So that helps me uh, to do that. But So do you have a web page, like yeah. a website that people can donate to? Because I want to make a donation myself. Well, the, um, you can find out details where you can do it, okay? So I have two websites. The one is for the book. As you know, the book is called If a Wicked Man. Um, and the website is ifawickedman.com. 
just one word, ifawickedman.com, and there'll be some book uh, information there. And one of the tabs, it will say ministry. So they can click on ministry, and then it will take you to the ministry web- website. So the ministry side of things, in other words, the religious side of things, is called escapeministries.co.uk. So it's one word, escape, www.escapeministries.co.uk. All the links will be in the description box below this video. Um, so have a look at them. You'll, you'll see more of what I do, more of the story. Um, you'll see some videos and stuff like that. I'll try and put footage up there. So it's on the ministry um, page. You can actually make a financial donation. Yeah, there's there's links to the bank account and people can, can put in or they can say, I want to help with a specific mission you've got coming up. So that's what people did with the South Africa one. Because, do, you have, do you have PayPal and stuff like that on it? Yeah, there's okay. mm, maybe not PayPal. They can pay uh, anyway. They can work it out on there. Okay. I don't ask for money. I, yeah. when, uh, when I go and speak at places, I don't ask them for money. Yeah. Uh, if they want to give it to me, I'll take it. Yeah. But um, people say to me, "How much do you charge for a speaking engagement?" I say, "I don't." So if you want to give something that will help people watching this, how can they contact you? What's well, your preferred method? Well, off off the website, so they can email me if they want. So they can email me at john at ifawickedman.com or they can email me at john at escapeministries.co.uk. Okay. 